James chapter 1. Himself, 
goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So Lord, I thank you again for your word. As we, as we dig into this chapter, Lord, it's, it's so easy to look at this and be condemned. Lord, when, when your word is not here for condemnation, God, it's, it's here, Lord, to, um, to restore. It's here, Lord, to give us uh, proper vision in areas that we may need to, um, for your spirit to, to do some work. And, and God, I just pray, Lord, that you would, that you would be glorified in this. Lord, that not our sin, not our, um, not our downfalls, not our weaknesses, and I'm glorified, Lord, but your son Jesus and the work that he did on the cross is glorified in this. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, I actually taught Jude a couple weeks-ish back. Um, it's the way last year or sometime. <laughs> Come on, guys. That was funny. I mean... <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, a couple weeks ago, I taught Jude. Also, uh, who's called the brother of James? This is, this is uh, his brother, the brother of Jesus. Um, son of Joseph, son of Mary. Uh, we... Again, just like a dude, he doesn't, doesn't call that out. It's just a, he calls himself as a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't, doesn't lean on anything else. Throughout this, he, he continually says, brethren, 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 brethren. If you, if you read this book, he's over and over not exalting himself, but putting himself on the same plane with those he's talking to. He's, he's not the brother of Jesus. He is one of the brothers. Join there with Christ. And so he's, he is he's walking humbly, uh, just like I mentioned with you, to, to think that these guys, they grew up with Jesus. They saw perfection, never sin, <coughs> never disrespect their parents, never, and yet they didn't believe. They, they saw the wisdom way older than, than how old he was. They saw, you know, just unbelievable things and yet they did not believe and so that you know in Jew we saw that, 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 that kind of uh, you know, again that was conjecture talking about that that brought him to a point of you know that his his greeting to them was as mercy as I suppose grace because I think maybe he you know was very aware of the mercy that was given him to not only be born in the house of, of, of the Messiah but to have rejected him until after he was he was risen from the dead. And so that's... Sorry. <laughs> that's a word of the word. Of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Um, until, we, until we die, we're going to fall into various trials. We're going to fall the the, the, uh, the King James version, the King James version says diverse temptations. This is, what this is talking about is, is we're going to fall into, into many things uh, that 
tempt us into sin, that tempt us to fall. Uh, I'm going to read the definition I, I found for this word. The word is, uh, I don't want to mispronounce it, but paramas, paramas, like parachute, but para, uh, mas, um, an experiment, attempt, trial, approving. Trial proving the trial made of you by my bodily condition, since condition served as a test the love of Galatians towards Paul. The trial of a man's fidelity, integrity, virtue, constancy, an enticement to sin, temptation, whether arising from the desires or from the outward circumstances, an internal temptation to sin. Adversity, affliction, trouble, uh, testing, rebellion against God, proof, proving. So these are all kind of definitions of what that what that word is used for, how it's used. So what does it look like? I, I think the we have a tendency when we hear this word temptation to sexualize it as men. We kind of that's that's the category we kind of naturally categorize it within is, is maybe money, but generally those are the kind of two categories. And we, though we know that it applies much broader, maybe it's just me, but maybe those tend to be the, oh, these are things we, we trip up in. So, so, but the thing that I want to kind of highlight here is um, that this temptation is very broad. This is many different areas kind of bring a couple out here where we don't feel, feel well or we have work to do, we are tempted to be lazy. When we are treated with the respect we feel due our position at home or at work, we are tempted to react in anger. When others don't act like we think they should act, we are tempted to stand in righteous judgment of them and probably talk about them behind their backs. When our circumstances when our circumstance is not what we plan for ourselves, we are tempted to be discontent and even angry at the Lord. When those, when those God has placed as authority in our life sin, we are tempted to use their sin as an excuse for our gossiping and reviling speech. When there is free or good food around, we are tempted to be gluttons and eat more than is necessary for health. And I can obviously go on and on and on, but the, the point being there are Diverse, various temptations and trials. They are they don't aren't limited to a certain category. They're, 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 the issue is is things that we um, that that can uh, draw us into sin. And yet it says, count all joy, and that's not a simple thing at all. That, that word is. It up again is hey, gaoli, hey, gaoli in the Greek. That phrase count means to count, to think, to esteem, to have rule over, to govern. And we, we have a tendency to think that our lives should be pretty smooth. We're, we're believers, our, our lives, I mean, we're children of God. Our life should be nice and smooth. Things should work out the way we want, you know. But, but the reality is, is we're going to be falling into various trials. Many of them because we're believers. Not they're, they're brought on because we're believers, and um, and we should count those as joy. And, it's, and that's no no small thing. Uh, <laughs> no, obviously, no small thing to do it is the. <laughs> The mindset change that that requires to think of this is about what the Lord is able to do in me through this trial rather than I want to be out of this trial. I want to be out of this uncomfortable position. I want to be, I want this thing that I want. God, give it to me. No, it's, it's what, what is God producing in you in that moment? Knowing, verse 3, that the testing of your faith Produces patience. Do you desire patience? 
So we can count on all joy because we're called to count on all joy because God wants us to be heavenly minded. Thinking about eternity, thinking about heavenly issues, thinking about what matters in the long run, not in the circumstance. We know this will produce patience. And patience is what? A fruit of the Spirit. And we should desire situations that produce the fruit of the Spirit in us. Verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Take a deep breath, pray, remind yourself, let patience have its perfect work, that you, that you might be perfect, perfected, complete. The perfect doesn't mean in, in biblically what we think of perfect as in no flaws, it means complete, it means, you know, done. God is working in you to finish what He started. If any of you, verse 5, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubt. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. When you pray for wisdom, act, no doubt. The Lord may make it obvious. He may part the clouds and speak to you. He may give you a still small voice in the heart. Or it may be that He's just guiding your heart and leading your heart. And that's what you're to do. Uh, there's been many times that when, when praying for wisdom, I have an inkling of what I'm supposed to do anyway, though I pray. And that's confirmed through, through that prayer that yes, that's what I'm supposed to do. There's been other times that I have an inkling of what I should do. And as I pray, the Lord Nope. <laughs> you should do this, right? <coughs> and so, but it's not necessarily a Joel, you should do this thing. It's not that. It's, it's he it's he guides your heart. And, and um, that brings to mind for me Psalms 40, the 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Matthew 6 3, and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. If you are delighting yourself in the Lord, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, as you pray for wisdom, you can trust that the Lord is, is uh, guiding your heart because, because your heart is for God, God's things, for His kingdom, for His righteousness, not you're focusing on what do I want, what is Joel going to be the how I do be, be improved in this, but instead you're focusing on God and you can trust uh, the wisdom that he, that he gives you out of that prayer. <laughs> Set your heart on the light of the Lord and seeking His kingdom and righteousness and then trust that He has given the wisdom you asked for. Verse 7 8. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all your ways. And do you find yourself unstable? I certainly have at times in my life been back and forth and up and down. I'm not sure what, what's going on or not. You know, pray, trust. See the person kingdom of God. Delight yourself in the Lord. And do. And do. Notice the context. This, this is after talking about temptation that he calls it. That we're, we're talking now about praying for wisdom and walking in faith in that, that God has answered that prayer. Not, you know, so that those, are, those are tied together contextually. It's not two completely different things that are, that are, that are unrelated. Verse 11 and 9. Or 9 through 11, excuse me. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen and burned heat than it withers the grass, its flowers fall, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in his pursuits. I think we have a tendency to put people in boxes. 
we see somebody who's successful and we like to raise them up into leadership of the church and we like to you know do things when we, when we see worldly success we feel good about that we want to exalt them and when we see people who don't appear to have worldly success we kind of don't want to hear what they have to say and don't want to necessarily listen to what's uh, what the Lord might be doing in them and that's it's a you know that's James is warning us against that type of mentality because that's a worldly mentality it's a, it's a looking at that's and that doesn't mean very godly heavenly minded people can't be wealthy and that doesn't mean completely broken um, corrupt evil people can't be poor that's not what's being said here what's being said here is we need to be careful to look on people like the world looks on people and categorize them in those type of ways that if, if they're worldly successful we should you know probably what's best for them is humility a, hum, a humble situation this, this is talking about um, letting glory in his humility. If it's if it's a wise, you know, um, lowly man, that, that he can be exalted and can glory in that. Not not. It's easier for that man to know that it wasn't of himself. This is this is the Lord doing the work in me. Then somebody who tends to be very successful at everything they do, and he gets put in a position of power or, or influence and guess what he's he's going to struggle with this of course i'm here i'm good at everything right and so it's not not that everybody's going to follow that but that's that's the you know this, this successful man should glory in his humiliation the lowly man should glory in his exaltation remembering that all that comes to nothing at some point just a man who's been highly successful just like the grass withers and the flower fades, you will perish. Verse 12 and 13. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, but when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Um, what are we tempted by? What 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 is the source of our temptation? This this verse is telling us it, it is not the Lord, but we are. I speaking for myself. There have been times where I have been very angry with the Lord because I didn't get something I wanted. I got, I fell into this sin again. I mean, what, whatever it might be, and I'm mad at the Lord. That, that anger is <coughs> aimed incorrectly. Though he allows us sometimes into situations that, you know, you think of Job. He was the Lord allowed that situation. But ultimately, the Lord's sovereign. He allows all situations, but that doesn't mean he's the one actively tempted. And so who is? Verse fourteen. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And this is where a lot of clarity can happen. Is understand. It's not the devil making you do it. It's your own flesh. It is your own sin. It is your own desire. I have a desire for this thing. And the Bible talks about, you know, the, the um, in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a, a roaring lion seeking who, who he may devour. But the idea of that is that he's literally walking around Looking for, looking for, is he weak here? Is he weak here? Looking for a weakness in the shield, a weakness in the flesh, something that, you know, you, you didn't, you're, you're weak there. You have a desire there, a fleshly desire for that thing, whatever it may be, for riches, for women, for whatever it is. <coughs> and the enemy can tempt you in, into, can, can take that desire, that temptation that is already there because of your desire, and he can entice you into sin with that. Right? But, but you can't blame Satan. You can't blame God. It is 
your flesh that gives my flesh that desires. Um, so, so a, a strange analogy as I was putting this together. Part of the gross part, part of it, it is a little gross. Anyways, obviously I struggle with the sin of gluttony, eating more than I need. So I'm tempted by a lot of food. I was watching a show the other day, and on that show, they were, they were cooking and eating Rocky Mountain oysters. I'm not sure if you know what that is. I think I do. It's sheep and or cow testicles. And so they're cooking and eating these things. And there's not one thing in me that desires to eat those. And so, my, my point being is that there's... I, Satan could dress them up any way he wanted to, and they, they, they could look... But, but I don't want to eat those. There's no desire in me that wants those. Right? And so the point being, it is the, the same thing goes, is that that's just kind of a, a visual, kind of a gross visual. Of there's... It doesn't matter what than it does. If, if your desires are under control and, and, and aimed at the right things, you can't tempt you in those areas anymore. You, you, you've, you've contained areas where he, he can find a soft spot while he's looking to devour. And so, you know, but the reality is, is that we are all, we all still have soft spots. We should, as we grow in the Lord, we should have fewer and fewer soft spots. But the reality is, what does what Ephesians tell us about, about um, faith? An arm, putting on the arm of God is, is we should, the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts of the, of the wicked one, right? And so this is, this is that, you know, those go together. It's the enemy, the fiery darts are those fiery darts of, of, of enticement and temptation. He's, but you have a shield of faith, trusting in, trusting in the Lord, trusting in wisdom, of being okay in the trial, counting it joy, uh, that it's producing patience in you. When you ask for wisdom, trust, trusting that the Lord is giving it to you, having faith and saying it is, you're walking in faith, you're trusting the Lord, you're, you're, you're getting the fruit of patience. You have that shield. You're, you now have, you're not relying on your soft spots because you've you know, engaged the shield of faith. And so, and that doesn't mean, I mean, there's, how many times do we, the, the point of that is sometimes we don't have our shield. And the Lord's not protecting us when we, when we're up, I got this today, Lord. I got it all under control. And so, and then we've got all these soft spots that, that, he, that the enemy can then entice us with our, with our flesh. And so, be aware of that. Be, be continually walking in faith. Be aware when you are not. Be aware when you're, When you are falling to temptation, whatever it may be, for me, for gluttony, when, I, when I'm eating a lot, when I have no control, that's a, that's a signal for me now that there's spiritual things going on. This is not that I'm hungry. It's, I, I, I'm, I'm falling spiritually out of control of my flesh. And that's a signal. It may be a different signal for, for you guys. It may be something else that you know when you start slipping in this area of your life, that's, you know, that should be a, a warning flag. Go get in the Word. Go put on your armor of God because you, you're open. Your soft spots are open and, you're, and your flesh is, is uh, open for the enemy. Verse 15. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. I want to say, desire is not necessarily a sinful thing. You can desire good things. There is part of the, the whole um, Buddhist religion is to eliminate desires. That's how you live a happy life. Is to, that's how you reach sin. Is to eliminate all desires. You don't, you don't desire them. It's not. A, it's impossible. But two, it's, it's desires in and of themselves are not necessarily wrong. It's where where do they target it as, and are they are they under control? 
And so, the problem here is the desire has conceived it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. If we fall to our fleshly desires, we allow that sin to, to start. Now all of a sudden we're if that's something we continue to walk in, we're weaker and weaker and weaker in that area. It's not, and eventually that can overcome us to where it brings up, brings forth death, be it spiritually, or be it physically. We, if we continue to walk in, the, in, in a weak fleshly desire, it doesn't just stay there. It doesn't just. The enemy's always pushing more. The enemy's always, you know, trying to to entice more. It's not just you're not just gonna okay. I've got I've got this desire under control. It's not gonna happen if you allow that desire to fall into sin. That sin is growing towards death, even though it may take a long time. You know, sometimes some seeds, you know, some seeds take very little time to grow. Talking physically, you plant done any gardening, weeds come up instantly, it seems like. Some seeds take a long time. Radishes, you could be eating a radish 30 days after you plant it. You're, you know, 120 days out on a, on a tomato before you eat tomatoes. So some seeds take longer. The same go with seeds of sin. Is that you, may, you may be getting away with getting away with the sin in your life that seems like it's not it's not going to probably kill me. It's growing. It's growing. It doesn't, doesn't reach full maturity in one day. <clears throat> Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow. What God wants for us is always good, is always perfect even though it may not seem like it in the moment. Again, this is coming after temptation. This is, you know, we can see two given options. It's sit in this situation that is uncomfortable to me and be content in that situation or go do something else. But God, is, God has, has you in that situation. And it is good. It is perfect even though it may not seem like it in the moment. Don't be deceived, my beloved brother. He's, again, this is, he, he says this, this whole section here starts off with, don't be deceived, my beloved brother. This is a, a brother who loves his other brothers and sisters. And he's coming in love. Don't be deceived in this. What God wants for your life is good. It may look not as fun or as good as what the world has for your life right now. But what He wants is good for you. Verse 8, Of His own will, this is capital H, God, the Father, of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Steve might yell at me later. So, who is the Word? Jesus, right? Who is the truth? Jesus. He, he brought us forth by the Word of truth. This verse for me brings to mind Colossians 1.6. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created created through Him, talking about Jesus, and for Him, talking about Jesus. The Father created us through Jesus, brought us to Himself through Jesus. Jesus is the centerpiece of our relationship with the Father. And now, we are something special. That's what this is talking about. What do we do with, what are we told to do with our first fruits? We set it aside and give it to the Lord that's His. He's calling us First fruits. We're set aside, even the Lord, we're His. So it's a kind of first fruits. They belong to the Lord. We belong to the Lord. 
So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We have 14 teenagers. You guys must know. That is a, an awesome and a frightful thing all in one. <laughs> um, and to add to the list of temptations that I, that I mentioned earlier is when your kids don't act like they're washed the dish or pick up the stupid Q-tips off the bathroom floor, we are tempted to stand in righteous judgment of them like we always do the right thing and scream at them to do better. And so this this is this verse honestly is is it's a heartbreaking verse for me. It's a it has many times brought me to repentance with my kids. Is that here I am? I I have these things. Yes, I've told them four hundred thousand times to pick up the key tip. But the point is, how often do I still walk in sin? And I've known for how long to not do this sin. And, and so I stand like. Like I've got it all together, screaming at them like they're, what's wrong with you people? And my screaming doesn't produce the righteousness of God. My, my anger, my, my wrath does not produce the righteousness of God. If instead I counted it all joy that the Lord has given me another opportunity for patience, the, my, my temptation for my fleshly desire to be respected, they should do what I tell them to do. To you know, be proud, yeah, I've got kids who obey, you know, I'm a great father. You know? <laughs> that all those temptations, if I instead counted those temptations as joy and walked looking for the patience that they were going to produce in me rather than instead I want my kids to do what I told them to do, my kids would be better off. Transparency there. It's easier to walk in grace with people. It's easier, as, as taking my, my kids as an example, is that if I would, and I do sometimes, I'm not saying you know, I'm always yelling at kids, but I'm just saying, as an example, the times when I walk in grace, knowing that they're learning, knowing that. This is a ch an opportunity for patience for me, knowing, counting it joy, a chance to, to lay out God's word to them. That grace and that love towards them can produce the righteousness of God, whereas my anger and my wrath cannot. And that's, this, is, this is a good picture of us because we have a tendency as humans to look around at our brothers and sisters stumbling in sin and forget the fact that we're stumbling in sin and get mad at them and, well, you should do this and you should do that and, and you know, yell and scream and any other crazy thing we may do. But that's not going to produce what God's wanting to produce in them. <coughs> the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Verse 21. Therefore, Lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implant, implanted word which is able to save your soul. Therefore, what is it therefore? Walk in faith. Recognize you are tempted by your own flesh and don't blame God or anyone else. Repent. Lay aside filthiness. Receive the power under control, receive with meekness, receive with power to control the implanted word of Jesus, which is able to save your soul. Set aside falling to temptation. Set aside standing in judgment of your brothers and sisters. Set aside blaming God when things are going the way you want them to go when, when you're tempted in this and tempted in that. Set those things aside and receive with meekness the implanted word which they will save your soul. Verse 22, but be doers of the word, not hearers, only deceiving yourselves.
For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and he forgets the kind of man he was. If you guys didn't see DA's teaching Sunday, I highly recommend you seeing his teaching. And one thing that was very poignant that he brought out is how easy it is for us to take joy in a new bit of understanding of the Word that God may have given us. Yay, I know this, rather than taking joy in actually doing it. I know something more. I'm not doing it, but I know something more. I picked up something new in church, but not walking in obedience to what, the, what we learned. And it's very easy to do that. It's very easy to, to become hearers that don't do anything, don't do much obedience, and just hear a lot of things. And we wonder why um, we're so stuck in sin. Let me read that section again. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he is. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Keep a, keep a proper view of who you are. Keep a proper view of, you know, where you stand. Don't become deceived. Don't blame God. Don't blame Satan. Understand your own weaknesses. Your own tendencies of your own flesh. Nobody knows them better than you. Don't lie to yourself about them. Don't forget what God says about you. There is none righteous, no, not one. And you'll be blessed with what He does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'm going to get a little political for a moment here. Is it an interesting, and I don't, you've probably heard me use the term churchianity before, and that's, there's, there's a lot in the church that is not biblical. It's just a, it's just kind of what the church does, and that's, you know, there's a lot of that all over. There's always been that. Humans tend to like to wrap things around what God actually says and do those things rather than what God actually says. And so, you know, we have a tendency when we see something like this does not bridle his tongue to think cussing. Because, you know, that, that tends to be, you shouldn't cuss. And, you know, there's some truth to that. We should not be having vulgar speech. But that's a, that's a minimal, you know, when, when, when the Lord's talking about bridling your tongue, he's talking about corrupt, evil speech. He's talking about gossip. He's talking about reviling against leaders. He's talking about those type of things much more so than saying what your current culture you live in thinks is a bad word. Not to say there are vulgar things that we shouldn't, we shouldn't say. We, we need to be careful. And why I bring this up is, you know, we, it is unbelievable to me right now how so many Christians are reviling against our president, because he may say a bad word here or there, when he's actively fighting evil, he's actively fighting against pedophiles that have been allowed to damage children for decades. And he's actively fighting the word. And many Christians are sitting back, but well, he said a bad word. But he's fighting evil. And so we should not, not that he should say a bad word or I should. Let's be, A, Christians, let's make sure we're praying for our leaders, recognizing uh, that there's real evil being, that there's real evil and corruption out there. He's actually fighting against it, standing up for all these kids that have been, you know, they, they've been vulnerable, brought into these um, 
Child Protective Services, many of them who are taking advantage of their vulnerability and, are, and harming them. And, and so understand that he's, he is meeting them where they are, uh, where they're vulnerable. And that's what God wants us to do. True, uh, pure religion is, is visiting these orphans and widows, those who are vulnerable, those who are weak, those who the culture uh, has forgotten about. I, mean, I don't know if you're aware there, there have literally been thousands and thousands of pedophiles that have been arrested in the last three years that have been allowed to roam for years. Media is not covering it, but they're getting arrested. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein, who didn't kill himself, was just the most high profile one. And there's many, many more. And so understand that though the media is not covering it, he is taking these guys down. And, and uh, pray for him. There are many very powerful people who went in there. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, that you have given us not a perfect president, or a president, God, who is, is going after evil. God, I, I pray, Lord, that, that the corruption that you have allowed to seep into our culture, Lord, that we have not been the salt and light we should have been. God, help us God, to be that salt and light. Help us, Lord, to also be active in front of first keep fighting the corruption in our own hearts, in our own homes, in our own churches, in our own places of work. And are busy praying and sharing the gospel. Uh, I just thank you for your work. Give us wisdom, give us understanding. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.